Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Today's video will be entitled Vito Palikas, the first hippie. And of course I'm referring to social engineering, banker anthropology, clandestine service managed, fads, trends, music, and fashion. In other words, in the matrix, nothing is authentic. Everything is fake. Everything is run through a repertory theater conference room. Anyway, Paul, Paul, Vito Paulinkus did not come from under a rock. He was born on May 20th, 1913 in Lowell, Massachusetts. Now, Lowell, Massachusetts is code for Cambridge, Massachusetts, because it's next door to Cambridge, which is home to Harvard University, which is an Ivy League clandestine service indoctrination center. So what I'm saying is Vito Polikas was born adjacent to the Harvard University campus, which includes Radcliffe Harvard, where Abigail Folger first attended. Anyway, Vito Polinkas, he lived to age 79. He passed away in Sonoma County um, October 25th, 1992. He went bye-bye. But not before he created quite a um, social engineering pop. All right, what do I tell you here? Um, so he bounced around Massachusetts for a while and um, supposedly he, uh, <laughs> at age 25, he attempted to rob a movie theater with a loaded pistol. And he, not only did he fail, he was uh, uh, apprehended, arrested, and he's looking at a 25 year prison sentence for armed robbery of a movie theater. They like to use that a lot. Remember, that's how they said that Lee Oswald, they called the police on Lee Oswald and like 24 policemen <laughs> descended on the uh, Dallas theater. <laughs> it's the last time, you know, you should forget about buying a ticket, right? Like, wow, the cops are going to be here if I don't pay my 50 cents to uh, buy a ticket, right? Anyway, what I wanted to tell you is that uh, he was apparently uh, sent off to a prison or a, the county jail. Yeah, that was in 1938 when he was 25 years old, but he was released by 1942 and he joined the Merchant Marines, then he was honorably discharged, even though he's a felon. <laughs> Fel felony armed robbery. Armed robbery is a felony in Massachusetts. Anyway, he's now out of the Marines, the Merchant Marines, and it's 1942, and World War II is up and running, right? And we don't have a lot of intel information of what happened, but... In 1946, he magically appears in Los Angeles. Now, he's 33 years old when he appears in Los Angeles. That's right. I said that, that Vito Polikas from Lowell, Massachusetts, first appeared in Los Angeles, West Hollywood, to be specific, at age 33. What do you think the chances of that happening in real life? All right. Well, anyway, he magically... Sets about uh, opening an art studio, and you're going to love this. I have the address for you. <laughs> he uh, somehow, with no money and no references other than his felony record, he's able to secure a lease at um, 303 North Laurel Avenue. Now, it's, that's not Laurel Canyon Boulevard, but it's close. It's in close proximity. It's a few blocks below... Hollywood Boulevard, which is below Sunset Boulevard. You know, it's probably seven blocks south of that on Laurel Avenue. It's close to Laurel Canyon Boulevard, but it's not. It's a different, different avenue. Laurel, Can Laurel Avenue 303. Now, that's not a 33, but if you get rid of a zero, which has no value, you'd have three threes. You'd have two threes. It'd be 33. He's 33, and he is residing in a apartment above a downstairs art studio. So on the ground floor of Laurel Avenue is an artistic studio 
that does all manner of artwork, dance and clay moldings and uh, watercolors and whatever other kind of artwork you can imagine. Anyway, he's 33 and he's running 303 North Laurel Avenue in West Hollywood below Sunset Boulevard. Okay, so time goes by. I'm going to skip over some things. And um, in 1961, a 17-year-old young woman whose real name is Sue Ann C. Schaefer, she walks into this art studio because she was on a mission for artistic achievements. And she sees there's dancing going on, and she's interested in this, and she comes back to the art studio a number of times, and quick like a bunny rabbit, she agrees to marry Vito Paulikas, Pol who is now 48 years old, and she's just turned 18. So Sue Ann Schaefer is going to marry a man 30 years older than her, and they have not been dating for very long, if at all. If you believe the story so they get married on july 7th 1961 so now we have vito polikas 48 years old married to sue ann schaefer who has changed her name and goes by sue that's spelled s-z-o-u and she is attributed to having created the hippie fashion look i'm going to call poppycock on that people i don't believe an 18 year old little girl is going to be the designer of hippie fashions, but that's what the uh, Wikipedia wants you to believe. They want you to believe that this little 17, 18 year old girl is now married to an artistic who's a felony armed robber, <laughs> by the way, whose first cousin married Winthorpe Rockefeller back, back east. See, it turns out that uh, Vito's father's brother, in other words, his uncle, his daughter, married Winthorpe Rockefeller. So there's a relationship with uh, Scion category here. Eva Paul. Eva Paul was his first cousin and she married Winthorpe Rockefeller. Anyway, getting back to the art studio. There they are. Now let me... Uh, read you some um, hippie talk. As the 1960s dawned on America, there were no clubs on the Sunset Boulevard at that time. The legendary Surro nightclub had closed its doors by 1957. But all of that was about to change. With a vice cop from Chicago, in January 1964, former vice policeman Elmer Valentine opened the doors to what is now the world-famous Whiskey A Go Go, which had primarily been a nude dancing club before it was the Whiskey A Go Go. And to be specific, the Whiskey A Go Go was opened um, at 8901 Sunset Boulevard sometime in 1964. I don't have the exact date on that. You should know that Lou Adler along with uh, Paul McCartney's friend, Peter Asher, who's the older brother to Jane Asher, who Paul McCartney lived with and dated for five years in London, England. First, they lived at the Asher home with Peter and his parents. Peter's parents and Paul McCartney. That's a lot of peas, right? Peter's parents, Paul McCartney and Jane Asher, all living together in the same house before Paul McCartney got his own home on uh, Cavendish Avenue number seven, <laughs> where Jane Asher moved in with him until she came home and discovered Paul McCartney in bed with Francie Schwartz, a Jewish girl from New York City. That was sort of torpedoed the Jane Asher engagement to Paul McCartney. That was in 1968, in case you're wondering, where for all those uh, Paul McCartney uh, conspiracy people out there, they according to them, Paul McCartney was murdered in 1967. But if Paul McCartney was dead and there was a fake Paul McCartney, then it was the fake Paul McCartney who had to have been sleeping with Jane Asher for a couple of years, or at least 18 months, without her knowledge. 
because she was with the original Paul McCartney from 1963. So you're going to have to tell me how Jane Asher and Peter Asher didn't realize that they played a switcheroo with the Paul McCartney. So anyway, I'm getting off track, I understand, but you've got to remember, I get a lot of um, people that tell me that uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was really Jimmy Carter and that Sharon Tate is really um, Marla Maples and that Paul McCartney was um, killed in a car accident in 1967. So that there would only be the fake Paul McCartney that was engaged to Jane Asher. So I, that's just too many things that you'd have to overcome for that story to be implausible. So Lou Adler, who's partners with Peter Asher, of course, <laughs> who was an executive at Abbey Road Records Studios, if you didn't know, he was in charge of A&R, which scouted talent like James Taylor, for example. He uh, enters into a partnership with Lou Adler, who's a Jewish man from Chicago, and they open um, the Roxy Theater on September 23rd, 1973. And then Quick Like a Bunny Rabbit, the Whiskey A Go Go opens up very quickly. And then Lou Adler opens the Rainbow Room in 1966, and um, the clubs come back to life. You should know that the section of Sunset Boulevard where I'm referring to is about one and a half miles long and it's in an unincorporated area of Los Angeles County. So it's not inside the city of Los Angeles and it's not inside the city of Hollywood. It's in this little zone, which makes sense because many homicides occurred within that zone and they were all investigated by the Sheriff's Department since the uh, municipal police were, that was not in their zip code, right? So you've got the murder of Jack Cassidy, you've got the murder of um, Salminio, you've got the murder of um, Art Linklater's daughter, Diane, you've got the murder of Connie Monty, you've got um, <laughs> the murder of um, Albert uh, Decker, Thomas Albert Decker. None of those murders were within the city limits of Los Angeles, do you see? You see, it's a little pocket. Now that's changed today. Now those areas are part of the city of Hollywood or part of the city of Los Angeles. In other words, that unincorporated zone of Hollywood has been absorbed into the cities of Hollywood and Los Angeles. So, but back in the 1960s and 70s, it was true that it was an unincorporated part of Los Angeles County. Anyway, there was a whole number of clubs that magically opened during the 1960s, just in time for the hippie movement and the psychedelic movement, which was being presented to us in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco, and being presented to us in Hollywood along Sunset Boulevard. So what I'm trying to tell you is, the, or also known as the Sunset Strip. So what I wanted to tell you is that uh, all of these are clandestine service events. All those clubs are owned by the CIA. They have fake owners like Eddie Nash, who's from Jerusalem. He's a Christian Jewish man from Jerusalem. It's not his real name. Um, Elmore Valentine, he's from Chicago. Lou Adler, he's from somewhere else. Peter Asher's from London, England. It just it fascinates me that all these people from New York or Chicago or London come to Los Angeles to tell us how to put on a nightclub. Like there's no one in Los Angeles or California that knows how to run a strip club or understands how to do present bands on a stage? Of course they do. But we got to bring in Bill Graham. We got to bring in Lou Adler. We got to bring in Elmer Valentine. We got to bring in Eddie Nash. It's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. And so anyway, we're talking about over a dozen clubs that pop up quick like a bunny rabbit over three or four years all over the Sunset Strip. Anyway, that's all part of the rollout for the hippie movement. So we have hippie clothes being designed in an art studio. Dancers are then hired. I don't know how they get the money to pay the dancers. There are 35 dancers. Then we have Vito Polinkas hires a partner, obtains a partner. It's presented to us. He's a friend. No, he's not. He's a business partner. And they roll out this um, troop, troubadours of dancers right on cue. And I mean right on cue. Okay, it's called a roving troop of self-styled freaks led by a now 
rebranded beatnik Vito Polinkas and his trusty, lusty sidekick, Carl Frizzani. Carl Frizzani. You could look him up. I haven't drilled into him. Anyway, so he's the leader of the dance troupe. And, of course, they have a name for the dance troupe. Um, I'll get to that. They are immediately um, integrated in with Frank Zappa, okay, and the birds, who apparently rehearse in the art studio when the art classes are not happening. The birds rehearse in this address, number 303, North Laurel Avenue, just south, nearby where the recording studios are. So you got the birds in there. We got Frank Zappa hanging out with Carl Franzini and uh, Sue and Vito Paulikas. We've got Jim Morrison and the Doors become regular friends. <laughs> All this is put together, right? I mean, this is not organic. This is a fake group. All right, so recruits for the Vito's dance troupe were very easy to come by. Yeah, no kidding. I'm sure the CIA interviewed them first. Among other firsts, um, according to um, the legend, Vito operated the first crash pad in Los Angeles in an open house to countless runaways where everybody was welcome for the night. Does this sound like the Charlie Manson mendacity to you? This is all going on in the early 1960s. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, a former groupie by the name of Pamela DeMar described the sort of scene that would go down at the crash pad in the basement of 303 Laurel Avenue. In one instance, two tenderly young girls were tonguing each other. Lesbian sex. All right, then rock producer Lou Adler said that Vito would come in every night at his, whisk, you know, his Roxy Theater with his entourage of mostly four or five really good-looking girls. It was a weird parallel because these looking good-looking girls are teenagers and Vito is 50 years old by now. By now. He's in his 50s because this would be 1964 and Vito would be like 51, 52 by 1964. So it was kind of a non-violent Manson situation. Well, that's a little plan word because Charlie Miles Maddox was completely non-violent. Only the television and the media tells you that, that Manson is violent. No, he's not. No, he's not. Anyway, in the beginning, Vito and Sue, they started having marriageable troubles in 1966, you know, and uh, <laughs> no kidding, they're 30 years age difference. What do they have in common other than the CIA job assignment they have? This is all laid out in Life Magazine, which is a clandestine service magazine. They did stories about uh, the magic that happened at 303 North Laurel Avenue, fake art studio. All right, I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm going to post the article. You can read this at your leisure. And um, you should know that um, the romance ended for Vito Polinkas and Susan C. Schaefer. Uh, they were divorced in 1960... Uh, Eight? So they were married seven years, I believe. No, they were they were married till 1975. So they were married 14 years. But uh, they moved up to Sonoma County in 1968. That was the deal. 1968, Vito and his wife Susan Schaefer moved to Sonoma County. They moved to Katati, which is outside of Santa Rosa. This uh, coincides perfectly with the um, Renaissance Pleasure Fairs being rolled out in Marin County, which is in close proximity to close proximity to Katati, which is near Petaluma. It's not that far from Black Point, Marin County. Not that far. That's the Petaluma River. And Vito and Susan were living not too far from the Petaluma River, not too far from Petaluma, just outside Petaluma. Today, um, Susan is living allegedly in uh, Sebastopol, which is close by. It's near the Bohemian Grove and um, closer to, clo it's close to Katati also. It's in chicken ranching country near Petaluma. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you this. That's all I'm going to talk about is that it integrates in with the Laurel Canyon 
military complex and all the artists, Neil Young uh, from Toronto, Canada, to the Jim Morrison, you know, the Jim Morrison doors, to uh, Frank Zappa, and all of the goings-ons in Laurel Canyon. So I thought you would get a kick out of that. It's 20 minutes. I'm going to wrap this up. Please like and subscribe my videos. What I'm trying to tell you is all the psychedelic colors, all the LSD, all the amphetamines that were distributed to campuses, all the music is fake. It's programmed by older people. I don't believe Paul McCartney wrote any of his songs. I don't believe he wrote one song. And I don't believe John Lennon wrote any music either. And I don't believe Neil Young wrote his lyrics either. And I don't believe Don McLean wrote American Pie. I don't. After doing this analysis and taking many showers afterward, I'm here to tell you everything about Hollywood is fake. Everything. The television is fake. The, the film industry is fake. The porn industry is fake. And the music industry is the fakest of them all. So they're all integrated. They're all social media content. Porn is content. Hollywood films are content, television is content, it's child entertainment, it's adult entertainment, it's X-rated entertainment. We have the Whiskey A Go Go, was formerly a new dancing club. Now we have the Body Shop, which has been completely reworked because you know you can't sell alcohol and have nude girls dancing on a stage. So now it's you drink Red Bull and they've changed the hours to 8 p.m. until 4 a.m. in the morning. When I went there, it was completely nude and they sold alcohol and club sandwiches and you could go in there like at 11 o'clock in the morning and I don't know what the time it closed. I went in there at lunchtime and uh, it was a classy joint. So I don't know what goes on at the body shop. I don't believe they're profitable. I don't believe any of these clubs are profitable. So I believe they're all propped up by the clandestine services that wants those clubs open to distribute their social engineering fake messages like the Viper Club where Phoenix Bottom was killed, River Phoenix. River Phoenix, whose real name is River Bottom. And you know, Joaquin Phoenix, that's not his name, it's Joaquin Bottom. They have a Jewish mother, and her name is Bottom. So it's River Bottom, who's the eldest of five children, and Joaquin Bottom, rebranded as Phoenix. Phoenix is fake, the rising of the Phoenix. Thanks for listening, we'll talk soon. Have a great day, bye-bye.